Well, thank you, David, for joining me today. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here today. Um, I'd like to start out by asking how you got started in the industry, because my understanding is you're also quite the athlete. Uh, <laughs> well, the older I get, the athletic status goes down quite a bit. Um, now I'm battling knee issues and oh, no. you know, a neck, neck injury I had several years ago and all kinds of stuff, but I'm holding on. <laughs> um, you know, I started off uh, <laughs> kind of kind of by an accident. Um, I was watching Little League World Series on TV when I was a kid, maybe four years old, and my, my dad was, you know, so excited about baseball, and he said, do you, you think this is something you want to do? And I was like, yeah, it's exactly what I want to do, and uh, of course, he meant baseball, and I meant being on TV, because these kids were playing on TV, so I think that's how I first gravitated towards, um, you know, wanting to get up and entertain people and be in this magical box, which was set in people's living rooms. And, right. um, you know, I ended up playing baseball my entire life, all the way through college and past, and I'm still playing baseball. <laughs> That's so, great. Yeah, it um, carried all the way through. Right. So tell me a little bit about how then you transitioned into acting as you got older. Uh, my freshman year in college, mm -hmm. I was uh, playing football. And um, we had to report early for football practice, so we're in the beginning of August, you know, before the students get there. And there was a girl who ran the student life department who was a senior, and I was a freshman, and their office was right there in our dorm. And uh, when I was a freshman, she was a senior, she was something else. So uh, I wanted to find out more what she was involved with doing, and she was involved in theater, and I signed right up. And uh, I, did, I did everything that I could to be around her, and did a lot of improv theater, and we did... Um, Kind of performances for the students and things and uh, it was really kind of a, a fun way for me to get to know her but also first time I did anything in front of people acting wise I never did it in high school or middle school or anything like that so for two years I did this improv theater and uh, I really ended up enjoying it. And that's, this was in North Carolina? It was, right? it was in North Carolina. So that's yeah. where you got your start? It was, Amazing. absolutely. Yeah. And then what was it, what was your first film? Uh, well, I actually ended up on a TV series first as an actor, and you know, I really thought that my career was going to be more in front of the camera for my, my whole, whole time. And uh, After college, I was drafted in football as a field goal kicker, and it uh, didn't work out. Uh, you know, I had big dreams of one day kicking that Super Bowl field goal to win the game, and I uh, didn't quite make it that far, but um, you know, I had a shot, and I did the best I absolutely could have done, and it wasn't good enough, which I, which I accepted that um, sure. years later. <laughs> <I did. laughs> it was heartbreaking at the moment, but what am I going to do now? You know, the athletic career is not going to work for football. But uh, I came back and I graduated from North Carolina State University, so I started coaching one of the kickers there. And uh, his girlfriend worked at an acting school, and she she and I were talking one day while we're working with her boyfriend, and she said, "Have you ever thought about doing any acting?" And of course, I go back to my two years chasing. The girl I was, you know, infatuated with in college for two years, and um, I said I did it then. And so she says, "Well, I'm working in acting school. Maybe you want to come check it out." And I did, and uh, ended up with an acting scene partner who was on a local TV series. And before I knew it, I was following her to set and meeting the producers, and ended up on the show as a regular for eleven episodes. Nice. And um, it was a lot of fun, a regional series, and got my start. And then you trend, you moved here. Yes. LA. Right. After the first season, uh, I knew it's something I really wanted to do at that point. Um, no one wanted to pay me to kick a football around anymore, so I figured maybe <laughs> maybe they'll pay to see me, uh, you know, pretend to take on an acting role in some other capacity and um, multi-talented. Multi-talented, right? Uh, you know, when one road ends, it actually begins the road to the next path in your life, and I think that's what happened. And. I met a manager in Los Angeles who dealt with athletes, so that was kind of my end because I had a professional athletic background, sure. you know, and a college background where I did multiple sports. You know, I did I played football and baseball, and I swam and and did things. So I, I had a, a versatility in the acting world mm -hmm. where I could transition into acting commercials and TV and film, where that was where I was focusing. Mm -hmm. You know, they need someone that can go hit a baseball. Well, I could do that. They need someone that could go swim down the pool. I could do that, and. Um, he wanted to sign me, so I made the move to Los Angeles, and he got me with one of the biggest commercial agencies that dealt with athletes on the planet. And I was able to walk right in, very lucky, and started working commercially at first. Okay. And um, then that transitioned into a few, uh, you know, independent film roles and some music videos, and uh, which led ultimately to a bigger film role. My first role was little part in Pearl Harbor, which is you know a little role in a big film, but it was a start. Yeah. And uh, it started kind of snowballing from there, and. Uh, getting work in front of the camera for a little bit. Right. So um, what was in, in, in that early work, what was maybe one of the, the biggest surprises in terms of roles 
would it be Pearl Harbor, Harbor even though it was a smaller role? Or what was, what was something that came up during that time you're like, wow. I think, I think one, of the, one of the biggest things was when I got the part in Pearl Harbor, um, you know, it's one of those parts where uh, you don't really know what to expect. My very first day on set, you know, I'm waiting to go on and, you know, and, and Ben Affleck walks by me and Josh Hartnett walks by me and there was, um, you know, Jennifer Garner and these people that I knew, I knew from watching them on other things. And, you know, I was, I was very, um, you know, it wasn't starstruck, but it was also kind of overwhelming to some degree because I see these people who have been in my life visually sure. for years and now they're standing right next to me. And I actually went up to Ben Affleck. Uh, we were... <laughs> waiting to go in the bathroom at the same time. So it was kind of a weird place to have a first meeting. But, um, you know, I said, you know, hi, I'm David Roundtree. And, you know, I, uh, I've actually done a lot of your scenes from Good Will Hunting in my acting class. And, and he was such a cool guy. You know, I didn't know what to, what to expect. And when he first introduced himself, he said, hi, I'm Ben. And I was expecting, hi, I'm Ben Affleck. Right. Because that's all you ever hear, Ben Affleck. Sure. He said, hi, I'm Ben. And um, he says, really, what, what scenes did you do? He was really taken that I, I took some of his work and put him up there. And, and um, I said, yeah, you know, I, I've been working on these scenes. I've done some of your stuff. And he goes, well, hell, you probably did them better than me, you know. And, and just having this, this humble attitude, that was my first kind of eye-opening experience, that these people are real people and that there might be an opportunity in this business for me. Sure. You don't have to be, you know, someone that is this somehow magical person yeah. to work in this business. That right. You could be a real person. You could be a humble person and right. come from there. And that was, that was really an eye-opening experience. And he was just a really cool guy. Mm. You know, and I always uh, admired him for that. Right. So now when I met you a few months ago, um, obviously I met you sort of through your director's hat. Right. Um, because this was right after Cut was released. And um, so you transitioned. Well, sort of transitioned because you're still in front of the camera as well. Okay. Um, but tell me about that, going from in front of the camera, behind the camera. Well, I, actually, you know what, I, I can date it back kind of to Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. uh, because... I was so interested in how everything worked. Mm -hmm. I had done it on a, on a smaller television scale, mm -hmm. but now being on this big feature film where I see you know, hundreds and hundreds of extras and, and how everything worked and how everybody had a job and watching you know, Michael Bay direct was really kind of a, an interesting experience. And I spent a lot of time standing behind Michael Bay and the camera work and watching the intricacies of how it played out. And I was fascinated by that. I, I wondered why he gave directions for this to happen and why this would happen and started kind of analyzing myself and what would I do and, and figure everything out. And the funny story was um, about my sixth or seventh day in, you know, I hopped up in a, in a chair and I'm just kind of watching things and I, I feel this presence come over me. And, uh, and I turn and it's, it's, it's Michael Bay and I realize I'm sitting in his chair and <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> and, um, you know, he, he, he knew my name. He said, uh, you know, and not in a good way, you know, he said, uh, Mr. Roundtree, you know, when, when you're directing, then you get your own chair. But until then, you know, this is my chair. I was like, oh wow. So I almost got fired. Uh, but he was really cool about it and it was very casual. It wasn't a big deal and that was the end of it. But to me after watching how this played out and seeing a big director actually knew my name, it meant a lot. Yeah. And I started thinking that maybe that's the path I should be down. Sure. You know, and I kept acting and kept working at that and was very fortunate to get some acting work and to be able to do it full time, right. you know, and, uh, and, and had that experience. But I just love the creative process. So I wanted to start doing my own things. Right. So even to take it back a little further, than that, I know that uh, there was some directing in your younger years. <laughs> so we need to talk about that a little bit because that's a really great first start. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's kick it back to like seventh grade. Uh, old school. Old school. <laughs> um, so uh, I looked for any excuse I could to get out of doing homework and school projects. I think you know writing papers growing up and. Um, I had an opportunity when I was in seventh grade to make a movie, a class project for something, and I asked the teacher, I said, can I make a movie instead of, you know, uh, writing a paper? And I got the green light to do it, and um, I ended up shooting a movie, and it was so bad. Um, I would love to see it now. I'm sure it would just be horrendous, but it was, I would film these little scenes telling what the project was about, and um, I didn't know how to edit, I didn't know how to do anything, so it was definitely just get in there and go for it. And I, I would take the VHS tapes and pop them in the VCR and play the scene off the TV and then take the camera and film off the TV, the scene that I wanted, and, and edit by just hitting pause and then fast forward to the next part. Now here's the next scene, let's do this one. And that's how I made my first movie. And then after that, it kind of became like a, an addiction where I kept trying to get away with making movies instead of writing papers. And, 
and, uh, you know, doing these big elaborate, uh, you know, uh, class productions and things. I said, I want to, I want to make something. So my, my junior year in high school, we had a big project on the sixties and I suggested let's make a movie. And, um, uh, for a teacher that was very strict and not known for being very, uh, generous with grades and, and, uh, we, <laughs> we, 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 uh, played off the, the Arsenio Hall show back then, which was the talk show. And I love the Arsenio Hall show. And Arsenio used to always have these people he'd come out and say, you know, and they'd give him the round of applause. And those people over there are people that did something, something. And um, so I had this idea. It was my first director idea that I really laid down. And I said, I have this idea. And our teacher, Mr. Wilkins, never gives, never gives good grades. So when our host, our Arsenio, came out, he said, and those people over there are people that actually got an A in Mr. Wilkins' class. And we cut to a row of empty chairs. And when we did that, the class just fell out laughing. And... And you got your A. Got the A. We got the A. I didn't get an A in the class, but I got an A on the project. Right. So. That was good. But that was my first decision as a director, I think, that really, um, you know, kind of made me feel like, okay, I, I understand how things can work. And as a director, if you're creative, you can you can play and there are no rules. You can you can come up with your own style. And right. uh, without realizing it, that was one of the first real, you know, real things that set me on this path. What are some of your favorite... Um aspects to being a director? What are some of the favorite things about being on set and, and shooting and um, those special moments that you see? Well, what are some of those for you? Film, film is a director's medium. Mm -hmm. You know, theater is an actor's medium. When the stage curtain goes up, the actor goes start to finish. There's nobody running in and saying, look, let's try it this way. Let's do a take two, take three, whatever. In film, a director has that ability. You can step in, you can you can run it again. You can try different blocking to get the angle you want. You can move the camera. You can do this. So it's definitely a director's, director's medium. When I was just acting, you know, you get a character and really you're limited with what you can do. You, you try to bring life to this character and you, you, you breathe your soul into this thing, but yet it's still guided by the, by the director on this thing. So when I'm, when I'm directing, it allows me to have a creative say in the overall aspect to put all the pieces together not just focus on one aspect of it, but really look at, you know, how this side's going to match with this side and how this character is going to match with this character and creating arcs all the way through and really playing with this and kind of being like a puppeteer pulling the strings. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's fun. You know, I, I like that side of it. I like, um, you know, having the ability to, to paint an entire picture and not just a little section of it. Sure. Yeah. Do you, um, so when you are directing your actors, do you let them play a little bit? Um, do you let them be organic? Um, obviously, there's a script and they have to follow it, of course. Um, how do you how do you direct? What what is your style in that sense? For me, if I hire an actor, it's because they can bring something to the table creatively. They're artists, and I don't want to limit their, you know, their artistic ability by saying it has to be just like this, just like this, just like this. Yes, in some moments, for sure. You know, if they're getting out of where their arc should go or it's not going to tell the story the right way. But I want to work with people who are able to bring some of their own touches to it. And that's where some of the magic really happens. You get out there and the actor will surprise themselves. And, you know, a lot of times, especially when we did Cut, uh, you know, there were so many talented actors out there. David Banks is phenomenal at improv. He's just, I don't know where he gets some of the stuff in his head. It just comes out and it comes out as magical. And that's not something that I could sit down and write and, and be that creative. So if I have a guideline, what it is, you know, I let them run with it. And we may run with it in some rehearsal or things like that or when it's going, you know. Um, but watching him and like Suze Lanier, when Suze came on from The Hills Have Eyes, they had this just incredible chemistry. Their banter was so phenomenal. It was structurally written in the script, but some of that dialogue that people talk about after the movie, they quote that scene. Well, that was David and Suze. Yeah. It wasn't what I put on paper. Sure. You know, and that is the fun moments. And as a director, I don't want to limit that. Yeah. You know, but I will. I will keep them within the realm of where it needs to go to tell the story. Of course. You know. Yeah. So then, um, tell me a little bit about, you, especially with like cut. I mean, you play Travis, who is a main character. So you're directing and you're acting. Obviously, directing is your main role. Right. <laughs> you right. know, the most important. I always have to look out for the project, right? Because right, right. you're looking at things from a larger perspective. Um, what was, what is that like? I mean, being both behind and in front at the same time. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I really, uh, I, I admire people that can really do this and pull it off. You know, I go back to Ben Affleck, Ben, sure. uh, and Kevin Costner, and, and Ron Howard. You know, people that have been in front of the camera. Now that Ron is doing more directing, 
you know, he's definitely not in front of the camera, but you still have Ben Affleck at Argo, you know, and, um, you know, Kevin Costner, they do some amazing work. And I, I admire what they can do, you know, so much because they're incredibly talented in front of the camera. They keep their vision behind the camera, but yet they have lives outside of this business too, which I think is so important. You know, I've got a three-year-old daughter mm -hmm. and she means everything to me. So knowing that these guys can still do the same thing, it inspires me. Now I want to learn, you know, what makes them tick, what makes them able to do this, because it's not easy. And when we did cut, uh, I originally wasn't going to play Travis. Okay. And um, after working these scenes over and over again, you know, I co-wrote it with David Banks, and so we were playing with these scene ideas, and he ultimately talked me into doing the role. And I wanted to find somebody else to do it, but um, I've known David forever, and you know our chemistry because of our friendship, you know, is is pretty solid. And and you know he really felt that because of our relationship and how long we've known each other, we would probably capture something more magical than somebody that's just put together, you know, that works together for three four weeks. And uh, it was a challenge, you know, wearing those hats. But um, I trust my crew. I trust you know David Banks. And if I'm doing a moment and acting in front of the camera that's not as real as it could be or it's not as deep as it could be, you know, my, my guys are going to say, hey, you know what, you can do better. You have more. You know, and I think it's a level of trust. You know, David Banks is, is a good friend. He's like a brother. So if I give him a directing note, it's not taken as a criticism against his ability or anything like that. It's taken as, okay, let's try this differently to get a better approach. Mm -hmm. And it's not taken personal. In the same way, if I do something and he says something to me, it's kind of done for the betterment of the project. Right. It's all about trust. Right. So let's talk a little bit about cut. I know that um, I, I know that some of it was based on some real life experiences, and so one in particular <laughs> that we've talked about that I'd love to actually you know have you share again because it's. Yeah, it's, it's kind of classic. You sure you want to dig that one up? That was, <laughs> it's um, kind of classic Hollywood. It is come to LA, you know, sort of fresh faced. It is. Everyone scenario. thinks that when they come to Los Angeles, they're going to get off the bus and they're going to be a movie star in ten days. Sure. And it doesn't happen. You you put in your time. You you learn and uh, to kind of quote Training Day. You know, you put in your time and you grow wise. You you learn about this stuff. It's takes 10 years to be an overnight success, you know. Um, Cut has been successful, but I directed my first film 11 years ago. So just like anything, the actors, they have to, they have to grow wise, they have to go through these experiences. And I went through some experiences that I will never forget. Uh, I was auditioning for a TV show on the Warner Brothers lot. So when you go to a studio like that, everything seems legit and big and you know, it's just, it's this incredible thing. And um, as I'm walking in, the security guard approaches me and he says, hey, I'm doing a project. I think you might be right for this. And of course, in my mind, I don't think anything of it. He works on the lot, he has security, but there are people that do projects. And you know, this is really before the time of all the webisodes and things like that. So I assumed it was something to it. Um, so I gave him my information and said, call me, you know, and, and he did. And um, he wanted me to play a, uh, a superhero uh, that was um, uh, kind of like a fan film to, uh, I guess, whatever his vision was of this. And he wanted to direct this little piece. So it was a test. And he had the authentic Christopher Reeve Superman outfit. So to me, that legitimized everything. It was good to go. And what he wanted me to do was come over to his house which I did, late at night, which I did, by myself, uh, put on this skin-tight spandex outfit, and uh, in the scene, he said, so in the scene, you're going to be tied up, uh, we're going to saran wrap you to this chair, and you're going to get tortured, and I want to see how you react to this, because in this scene, Superman has, you know, lost his ability to, you know, fend off evil, uh, whatever his storyline was, and I said, sure, let's do this thing. Uh, and he filmed it. And nothing bad happened. But looking back, think of what could have gone wrong. Right. I'm t I, could not, I really could not move. He had to cut me out when we're done. He could have done anything at all to me. I didn't know this guy. I didn't know his last name. All I knew was his address. And nobody knew where I was. Right. I wasn't getting paid to do this project. It wasn't under the, the Screen Actors Guild Union. My manager didn't know. Right. Uh, he could have done anything. So, so that uh, was a valuable lesson when I came out, that really hindsight feeling like, wow, what did I do?
Right. And um, that inspired the scene in Cut with right. Jake. You know, Jake comes in, he's, he's a needy actor, which I was. I was so desperate. I want to do work. I want to get out there. The Superman outfit. Are you serious? Sure, let's do it. And uh, I really wanted to get out there. So in the storyline, Jake, of course, is the needy actor who's working at the film warehouse and, you know, trying to get seen and make contacts and agrees to go to the warehouse late at night. He agrees to be zip tied to a chair and uh, they bring the killer out. And what are you going to do? Right. And so that, that was the inspiration for that scene. And kind of a warning to, you know, the young people who come to Hollywood to, you know, see their dreams out there and, you know, just be smart about it. A lot smarter than I was. Right. You know? Well, that's the other thing, too, is somebody could see that part of the film and be like, oh, that doesn't happen. <laughs> it happens. That's not real. <laughs> no, it happens, it's right. Real. It's real. It, those things do happen. Right. Which is also how Cut was inspired originally because of the Canadian story. Right. There was a guy in Canada who was a director, use those terms loosely, that would invite people over and in the garage, he would tie them up and really kill them. And, and he was videotaping this and making his own snuff film. So that's kind of how the original story of Cut started off. And then David Banks and I would bounce ideas back and forth. And I shared that story with him. And he says, oh my God, that has to be in our story. Right. And so that's how it went in. And we both shared stories that were like this. You know, different people who are in this industry that promise you one thing, but then there's strings attached. Sure. And do you sell your soul to the devil? Right. Or do you try to stay on the, the straight path and make it happen? And I know people that have sold their soul and, and regretted it. Yeah. And it's sad. Right. It's really sad. Um, I'm just a little bit of a, probably a cut plug here because <laughs> I enjoyed it so much. Um, but also there's, um, with the DVD, there is commentary um, that's really kind of cool for people to check out. Can you share a little bit of that? Sure. Uh, of course we want them to watch the film as well. Yeah, we but... <laughs> do. Watch, <laughs> watch little, the film. There's a little treat in there. There is a treat. Uh, you know, the cut DVD is now out, which is we're really happy about that. It's in, um, you can get it on the Netflix DVD queue. You can put it in, they're sending it out, and you know, you can get it off Amazon and a bunch of other sites. So, uh, but what Congratulations. it- Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, to, to get something out there is great. In fact, I was by the DVD store the other day. I went to get a movie uh, for my wife and I to watch, and our cut movie poster was hanging in their window. That's great. I was like, wow, that's fantastic. You know, something we made is that, and it's hanging right there in the marquee spot. You know, it's like, that's, that's great. We're ahead of Avengers, <laughs> at, least, <laughs> at least in their window. Um, you know, so not quite the, the money that Avengers has pulled in, but you know. Uh, I'm okay with that. We're, we're, we're ahead of them in the DVD store. Right. Uh, but the, we wanted to offer a behind the scenes look at cut. So we, David Banks and I sat down and we did a full commentary. And I think you can really see our chemistry during this commentary, but we explain a lot of things. We explain, you know, why certain things are in there and what inspired certain events. And it's really kind of fascinating. Um, you know, we both sat back and we listened to the commentary later and it reminded us of this journey because it is a journey. The whole process is a journey. Any kind of filmmaking is a journey. And, um, you know, reliving those moments and, and why we chose to do certain things and why, you know, certain uh, moments happened in the film that we chose to do and how to make all that tell our story. And it's important because when you watch the movie one time through, you don't get a lot of that. Mm -hmm. When you watch it a second time, you start to grasp it. If you watch it a third time, it all kind of makes sense. And most people aren't going to watch a movie three times, but cut is very layered. Yeah. And everything is in there for a reason. And the commentary offers some, some uh, explanation for that, I guess. Right. You some know? of those reasons. Some of those reasons. <laughs> yeah. Like why it's inspired by true events. Right. Yeah. So I'd love to actually have you share a little bit about what you have coming up. Sure. What you're, what's currently in the works for you. Yeah, um, I am currently uh, executive producing a 3D sci-fi animated feature film called The Body Defenders. It's my first time ever working with animation. Mm -hmm. uh, the animation is being made out of South, uh, South Africa by Patrick Garcia, who's a fantastic animator. His team uh, includes people that have done work for you know Pixar, Toy Story 3, this kind of stuff, but they're independently making this. And um, the story is great. The animation is great. It's geared toward like a Toy Story audience where kids will enjoy it, but adults will still enjoy it. Sure. And we are in the process of starting to cast and record the voices. And, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help direct some of the voices out here in Los Angeles. So that'll be a lot of fun. And we're in that process right now. Uh, for future stuff, I have two uh, films I'm pretty excited about coming up. Garrett Manor, which is a voodoo-based thriller shooting in Louisiana. Um, we have several attached actors to it already, which is great. Uh, Danielle Harris from the Halloween franchise, who's been in 100 movies, <laughs> and um, just a terrific actress who's 
uh, can really pull off anything. She's such so nice. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed spending time with her and meeting her and speaking with her about about the parts. And uh, she'll be fun to work with. Uh, Sean Patrick Thomas from Say the Last Dance, and you know, and, and he's um, Love him. just he's amazing. And just the charisma that he presents. It's gonna be fun with him. And uh, Vivica A. Fox is attached and. So it's, it's just starting the casting process. Okay. That film will take place uh, you know, later this year at some point. Okay. Um, another film that uh, we're looking to get started in October is a film called Dissension, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm really excited about. Um, I was originally pitched the idea by casting director Dia Weiss. Uh, Dia did um, I, Robot, um, recently God is Not, God's Not Dead. I think the movie that done by Freestyle Releasing, which is you know, people almost 60 million in the box office. So. Um, it's going to be a fun project. Uh, David Tybor and I are actually co-directing that one. Mm. Uh, David wrote the script. Uh, John Andrusi is the executive producer on this film, and uh, we're going to we'll look to shoot that in October, and it's going to be a lot of fun filming in an insane asylum. Uh, right so, up your alley. Right up my alley. <laughs> uh, I think one of the critics said he, he sees a padded room in my future um, after watching Cut, and uh, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the padded room. I don't know. There's your uh, But a really good story. And David Tybor wrote the script, and it's it's such a captivating script, uh, and I'm really excited to do it. And he's he's very talented. He's very intelligent, and um, we've never even met face to face, but our conversations have been over phone and over email. And I really enjoyed working with him so far. So it'll be my first feature working as a co-director. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm excited to work with him on this project. Nice. It'll be a lot of fun. I love the shirt, by the way. Thank you. Creativity is universal, and it is. It is. It sure is. Yeah, and this is brought to you by Stage32.com. Um, Stage32.com actually is a, is a great website. For those that don't know, it's kind of a, a Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, you know, for filmmakers. And anybody in the industry, actors, you know, makeup artists, uh, you know, editors, directors, whatever. And um, uh, it's been very instrumental in my career, you know, in the last two movies. We've used over 40 people off of the site great. that have come and gotten paid to work for us. And it's, it's great because you can, you can look at their footage right there on this website. You can open it up and you can see, you know, what they've done. You can see their resume, their headshot. If they're uh, a, a cinematographer, you can watch the reel. You can learn who they are and communicate directly with them. Where in the past there was nothing like this, uh, so everything was okay. Well, do you know somebody that can do this? Do you? Yeah, I think I worked with this guy years ago. Let me dig up his number, and right. it was really hard to kind of make those connections. But this is worldwide, run by RB Richard Vado, mm -hmm. um, was the creator of this, and um, I've actually become friends with Richard since we've done the two films, and uh, he's just such a, a nice, genuine guy, mm -hmm. and he's doing this to create this avenue which never existed. Right. So I go to them and we're, we're looking for, you know, we're filming out of state, so we've already put notices up. You know, we're looking for this out of state. We're looking for possible, you know, hair and makeup here. We're looking for this, 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 and right. it makes it so easy. And that's a hub, a place where you can kind of go it is. and find all of that. It is. And we actually released Cut, um, our world uh, premiere release. We did a, a VOD release online with Stage 32 in collaboration with this guy. So I have all the love in the world for them. Aww. Yeah, they're great. Hence the shirt. Hence the shirt. Um, <laughs> there you go, stage32.com. <laughs> little promo there. Uh, That's why I brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But no, I, I, I genuinely believe in them. If you're, in, if you're in the industry, you should be on this site because it is a great networking resource. Right. And it's a great way to uh, find out who else is out there and get other people interested in what you do. Right. So it's, it's fantastic. I, Big fan. And they'll be posting this on their site, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe now so. Now that you've got the shirt on. Right. Yeah. There we go. stage 32com Thank you so much, David, for your time. Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate the time today. Thank you.